Well, you may be seated. Boy, we're having church today, don't you think? Amen. I'm so grateful for our worship ministry. I know you are as well. Uh, but um, hopefully the fun doesn't stop now because we get to open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to continue in our study of the Beatitudes. And I find it interesting at this point in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus gets to uh, because he begins to talk about thirst and hunger. But then he attaches these concepts to uh, being satisfied or being filled. You know, I don't know about you and your home, but uh, this is what takes place every night in our home. All right? Uh, most of you know we have four kids at our house. And every single night, we have certain trigger words that are like a cause and effect type situation. Okay? This is what I'm talking about. If we mention bedtime, if we mention pajamas, or if we mention anything to do with going to bed, okay, there's this cause and effect that takes place that all of the sudden we have four little hoolums that are just all, re all, uh, all of the sudden hungry. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Every single time, all right, we say, all right, hey, uh, kids, it's time to go to bed. Boom, one of them all of a sudden says, Dad, I am hungry, okay? We've had all of this time. We had dinner together. I remember we were all there, okay? We had dinner together, and now we've had a couple of hours for you to think through this hunger that is within your spirit, uh, but it's until bedtime that it actually comes to fruition every time, okay? But then, so we finally get through the process. Everyone's in bed. Everyone is settling down. Uh, without many tears, okay, usually the tears are for me, but usually without many tears. And then we say our prayers. We begin to shut the door with almost this sigh of relief, as if another marathon has been accomplished. <laughs> and as we start almost with the door shut, another little hoodlum says, Daddy, I'm thirsty. Every time, I'm talking every single night, but I love you, all of you, okay? Everybody that can hear. All right, but every night, uh, those are our triggers. I, th I find it interesting that Jesus kind of goes here. You know, Jesus takes this universal concept of being hungry, this universal concept of being thirsty, and he takes one of the most dire physical needs that everyone experiences, and he applies it to our spiritual lives. He says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do, do you see the paradox that is right before us? How can it be that you can have hunger? How can it be that you can have thirst and yet still experience a feeling, still experience a satisfaction? Because what Jesus is getting at is that not only are you universally thirsty and hungry, but all of us in this room, everyone that Jesus was addressing, everyone has the same spiritual need to be filled. And I think that in order for us to really understand this, what was Jesus talking about specifically? I think in Psalm chapter 107. You know, I love this about God's word that, that we can look to the Old Testament to help expound on, on elements of the New Testament. And they point toward one another. And I think Psalm 107 gives us even further commentary on what it means to hunger and thirst. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me to Psalm chapter 107. And we're going to read verses 4 through 9. All right? And so if you got it, say got it. All right. Let's stand together in honor of God's word and let's read these verses. Verse 4 says this, it says, Some wandered in the desolate wilderness, finding no way to a city where they could live. They were hungry and thirsty. Their spirits failed within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He rescued them from their distress. 
He led them by the right path to go to a city where they could live. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. For he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you just speak to us now? God, we, we realize in this room that, Father, we don't deserve to hear your voice. But, God, you are gracious in that way, that you would speak to us. And so, Father, would you give us ears that are attentive, hearts that are open, a mind that is focused so that we can hear your voice clearly. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We may be seated. I find it interesting that the Bible often has these moments that are surrounded by eating and drinking. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, the Egyptians kind of celebrate, uh, excuse me, the, the Israelites uh, celebrated uh, going out from bondage of the Egyptians uh, through a feast. I mean, it was kind of surrounded by this feast. And, and even the Old Testament goes on for chapters about what is clean to eat, what is unclean to eat. And not only that, but even in the New Testament, we see that uh, New Testament disciples, Jesus told us to, in order to remember him, that to eat and drink is, as a reminder of his covenant with his people. And I think that it is often, and even looking forward to heaven, that heaven we can understand that is going to be a final feast together. And this is the way that the New Testament describes it. And it's often around these critical, critical moments in the life of God's people. And food and water, they're representative of our internal longings and desires. It's this representation, it's symbolic of a spiritual thing, that we all have this longing within us, but see, our desires, they do something within us. You see, the first thing that we need to understand about hunger and thirst is this, that a longing heart is the condition that leads to God's blessing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. This makes absolutely no sense. To say that it's upside down is an understatement. To say that this is against the grain, against the philosophy of the day, and even our day, this is against the grain. This is against our philosophy of the day. But I think what Jesus is getting at is that he takes this universal physical truth and as he applies it to our spiritual understanding of our relationship with the Lord, I think that there's much to be learned here. You see, Paul gets to this. When he talks about uh, what, what our desires can do, you see, our desires, because we all have those within us, and by the way, it's not that a longing and desire is evil in any way, because we actually see that we have a desire, we have a longing within our hearts even before the fall. You see, Genesis 3 wasn't the introduction of what it means to have desires. A desire became before the fall. The problem with Adam and Eve is that they were desiring something that was outside of God's design. They were desiring something other than the Lord himself. And so what we must understand is that in order to be blessed, we have to hunger and thirst. But what do we hunger and thirst after? See, this is why Jesus takes it, and he says that you must hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, everyone hungers. Everyone is thirsty. But it depends on what you are hungry for. What are you thirsting in your life? What are you longing for? What is the depth of your heart truly longing for? You see, David said this in Psalm chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. He says, as a deer longs for flowing streams... So I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. You see, David came to this point in his life where he understood that where evil desire can lead him away from God's will, but a longing uh, heart for the things of God, it leads you to the presence of God. We see this in our design. Augustine says this, 
He says, thou made us for thyself, and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. You see, what Augustine is saying here is that we are all made the same way. That we have this intrinsic value about us that, that has a desire for something, which means in return that all of us experience this emptiness inside of us that we are trying desperately to fill. And what we see here is that we are too long after righteousness. This is the concept of being blessed. And this is what we see in verse 5, Psalm 107, verse 5 through 7. It says, they were hungry and thirsty. Their spirits fell within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He rescued them from their distress. He led them by the right path to go to a city where they could live. You see, your desires, your longings, they are leading you somewhere inevitably. Whether you realize this or not, that this is a truth from God's word, that what you desire most is where your actions are headed. And so that's what we see from the psalmist. This is what we see from Jesus to be cautious of your desires, be cautious of your longings because they are leading you somewhere. And so what kind of longing are we to have? Well, this is why Jesus says to long for righteousness, because this is the truth we see about righteousness, is that a righteous heart is the condition that receives God's blessing. You see, this is what we have to understand is that only the righteous will actually be the recipient to God's blessing. It's not that you are longing. It's not that you have a hunger or a thirst. Everyone has that. What is dependent here, what is conditional is what you are longing for. And that is what is leading you to be a recipient of God's blessing. And what we see from Jesus is just as your physical life depends on food and water, your spiritual soul depends on the righteousness of God himself. You see, this is why Jesus says just a few verses later, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he says, unless, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, guess what will happen? You will never get into the kingdom of heaven. He says, unless your righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, what is he doing? Jesus is saying, listen, the religious activity that you have been hanging on to, that's not what I am equating to righteousness. Jesus is not saying, hey, I need you to be more religious so that you can achieve my blessing, so that you can receive my blessing. You see, uh, those who understand their brokenness, are the ones who understand their need for righteousness. Do you see how the Beatitudes are building on one another? Jesus starts with, hey, everyone who is completely poor in spirit, those who uh, will mourn, those who are meek, it's because Jesus is building this case here that unless you understand your brokenness, you will never mourn your sin. And unless you ever mourn your sin, you will never come to the point of humility where you understand that you need something outside of yourself. And because that you are so broken and you need something that you cannot have on your own, this gives you a desire, a longing for something that you cannot have. Do you see what Jesus does here? is he says that everyone is hungry and thirsty for that which you can never achieve. It's almost like this impossible task to be fulfilled. And it's leading us toward this understanding that the, what the Pharisees are attempting, what the scribes are attempting, what the Sadducees are attempting, what the Essenes are attempting in their own power will only leave you empty-handed every time. You see, this is what religion does. You see, religion will tell you that righteousness is about conformity, that if you just conform to this list of rules, then you will achieve righteousness. But Jesus says that righteousness is about being transformed by the Spirit of God himself. Religion will tell you that righteousness is based on your appearance of the outside, what takes place on the outside. But Jesus says, no, 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 it is what is on the inside of your heart that really matters. 
You see, religious activity leads us to a point of busyness, but always leads to a point of continued brokenness. And Jesus says, I'm not after your religious commitment. I'm after your spiritual surrender. You see, there's a completely different understanding is that when we understand that this is not something that we can achieve on our own, it takes someone other than ourselves. This makes us desire something that is not within us. This is why Jesus says just a chapter later in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. You see, Jesus is turning the religious understanding of the day completely upside down. He's saying, no, 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 listen, it is not about what you can do. Listen, it is only about your surrender to me. And we cannot think for one second that our pursuit of religious activities will lead us to the point of being recipients of God's blessing. It's not how the gospel works Righteousness is achieved by faith because of God's grace. This is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. You see, those who are not humbly longing for God and his righteousness are the ones who are proud and have the opportunity to boast in their own actions before the Lord. But in the gospel, what we understand is that there is no room for you and I to boast before a holy God. That even in our greatest attempts of achieving righteousness, that is filthy rags before this holy God. You see, religion misses everything. Religious activity the things that we fill our lives with that are apart from God's righteousness and what he does in and through your life always will leave us empty-handed. You and I cannot achieve satisfaction. We can't achieve being filled to the point of contentment apart from God's spirit. And this is what we see thirdly is that a content heart is the condition that continues in God's blessing. You see, the promise from Jesus is very clear. It's very clear to us because you will be filled if you are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's a guarantee from the Lord himself. He says that if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. And this is a continuous action. The more that you desire God, the more you hunger for the things of God, the more you thirst for righteousness, it's as if you are digging a well deeper and deeper and deeper into the things of God. And as that well is drilled deeper and deeper, your longing for him grows, your knowledge of him grows, and he continues to fill you over and over and over. I think this is interesting. The way that we can describe a satisfying hunger is because we are only satisfied when we are truly hungering more and more for Jesus. You know, I think this is exactly what we see in Isaiah chapter 55. In Isaiah 55, 1 through 2, it says, come everyone who is thirsty, come to the water and you without silver, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. Do you see what Isaiah is saying here? He's saying, listen, God is giving us these instructions that He says, stop spending time, stop spending resources, stop trying to purchase things that that you think will satisfy you. He's saying, listen, those things don't matter. Listen, what is going to satisfy you is if you come to the Lord himself. You see, we see the same thing with Jesus. When you get to John chapter 4, you have this moment where Jesus comes face to face with the woman at the well. 
This woman just keeps coming to the well day after day after day. Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? And obviously confused, she's looking at Jesus and saying, you don't even have a bucket. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus tells her, he says, listen, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would be asking me for a drink. And he says this in John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. You see, there are moments in our life where we just keep grasping at everything around us. We try to fill our lives with with everything around us, and it only leads us to this emptiness. And Jesus tells this woman, listen, you can come to this well every single day for the rest of your life, but it's always going to leave you at night thirsty once again. It's always going to leave you empty once again. He says, but if you drink of me, if you take my water, he says, you will never thirst again. He tells everyone the same thing. He says that I am the bread of life. Anyone who eats of me, they will never hunger again. Everyone who drinks of me will never thirst again. This is the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the promise that he gives anyone who comes to the Lord will never thirst, will never hunger again. You know, there's this moment in World War II And the USS Indianapolis was returning from a mission on July 30th of 1945. They were were transporting this enriched uh, uranium to allied forces in the Pacific. And that, that boat, that ship never returned home. It was attacked by a Japanese torpedo and it inevitably sunk the USS Indianapolis. It only took 12 minutes And 300 of the 1,200 men died immediately. 900 went into the water. And during four days and five nights without food, without water, without any hope of having life. And the ones that survived all of the shark attacks, they were tempted to drink the water around them. Can you imagine being so thirsty and being surrounded by millions of gallons of water right around you. And all you have to do, you think to yourself, if I could just take just a little bit, it'll quench my thirst. If I could just have just a little sip, it will quench my thirst. A survivor gave his account of the story. He said that he was swimming around trying to just prevent the men from drinking the water. He was saying to them, I know you're thirsty, but you can't drink this. It's only going to kill you. You can't drink this. You can't do that. It's going to end your life. And within hours, everyone who drank of the seawater, within hours, their life had ended. How many of us, in attempts of satisfying the emptiness within us, we just continue to drink the seawater of this world around us? You see, what Jesus says is, listen, don't don't drink of that water. Don't drink of the world. Stop trying to satisfy within you what only I can satisfy for you. You see, so often, even as believers, that we fill our lives with so much of the world around us. We fill our mind. We fill our heart. We fill the void within us with the things of the world, and we think it's going to help us. We think, but in the end, it only leads to destruction. In the end, it only leads us away from the Lord himself. And the invitation from Jesus is, don't drink the water of the world. It is a trick. But everyone who would drink of me you will be satisfied eternally. I don't know about you, but I know that there are many in this room that you have never made that step of faith, that you have never come to Jesus to drink of the eternal lasting water that he has. What this means is that you give your life to Jesus. 
What this means is that you surrender your life to Jesus, that you say, yes, Lord, I know that I'm trying to fill myself in every other way possible, but I surrender to you today. You can pray for the Lord to save you, and he will hear you, and he will save you. It says this in Psalm chapter 107, verse 9. It says, for he has satisfied the thirsty, and he has filled the hungry. Maybe that's you this morning. You know that you are so thirsty. You're so hungry. And you're so desperate for the Lord to fill your life. Well, today is your day of salvation. Whether you are right here in this room or watching online or wherever you are in this, watching around the world, you can give your life to Jesus today. Will you just bow your head and just close your eyes just for a moment? And I don't want anybody to be distracted during this time. I don't want anybody to be distracted of what God may be doing and stirring in your heart. But I do know for a fact that there are many people right now who can hear my voice and you're just thinking, I need to give my life to Jesus. Will you just pray right now? We just pray, God, I give you my life and I give you my heart. I need you to save me. I need you to fill me in the ways that only you can. Will you just pray that right now? Just pray that wherever you are. And if that's you, if you're praying that prayer, maybe for the first time, with every head bowed, with every eye closed, will you just lift your hand up to me so I can know to pray for you? Just say, that's me. I'm giving my life to Jesus right now. That's me. I see you over here. Anyone else? Right here. I see you, brother. Is there anybody else who's saying, yep, yeah, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus. Anyone else? Those of you that raised your hand, I just, I just want to ask a favor. Would you just meet me? In just a moment, we're going to sing a song together. Would you just meet me right outside these doors? And I would just love to pray for you. That's it. There's no tricks. There's nothing like that. I just want to pray for you. Maybe others of you in the room that you saw these baptisms and you know, I need to follow Jesus in baptism. I need to be baptized myself. You just come back right outside these doors with the green banners, and I'd love to help you get signed up for baptism. Maybe you're in this room right now, or maybe online, maybe you're thinking, I need to join Green Acres. I need to be a part of this church family. Well, you respond during this time of worship. Whatever God is stirring in your heart, just be bold, be courageous, and move. Heavenly Father, this is your time. God, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to stir in our hearts in ways that only you can. And so, Father, in those that you're moving, God, I pray, Jesus, that you would give them that courage right now to respond. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As you look up, I'm going to ask that you stand up. And those of you that need to respond, you respond in the middle of this song. You just go right back there as we are singing together. Uh, others of you in this room, I want to invite you. We have a table set up out in the foyer. If you want to sign up to help with our preschool program and our ministry there, we would love for you to be there. Maybe you want to greet, be one of our first, part of our first impression team. You can go and help us with that. Uh, but you respond right now during this song. Let's sing together. <laughs>